I believe that there's an alternate to that that is emerging now, and that is the super reality. So a super reality through AI can see, can analyze, can calculate in many dimensions, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's like a hypercube, if you will. And I think that's going to be a very, very interesting、uh, manifestation of AI. I'm Isha Da Vinci. This is the Grift Podcast: Conversations to Get You Ready for the Future. Do you think that AI are good for humanity, or is this just the beginning of the end? My guest today believes that AI are not just good for humans, but they will allow us to see the truth for the very first time. John Noster is a thought leader at the intersection of technology, science, medicine, and innovation. He's the founder of Noster Lab, a globally recognized innovation think tank, where he defines, dissects, and deliberates global trends in technology. Ranked among the leading global influencers in innovation and technology, he's been honored with titles ranging from most admired to top disruptor in various fields, including technology, innovation, life sciences, and the pharmaceutical industry. He's a popular speaker across the globe, where he presents vibrant and insightful perspectives on the future of innovation. His focus on guiding companies, NGOs, and governments through the dynamics of exponential change is complemented by his keen understanding of the diffusion of innovation into complex systems, particularly in technology, artificial intelligence, and large language models. His writing contributions are frequent and influential, with over 500 articles published in Fortune, Forbes, Psychology Today, Bloomberg. And prestigious peer-reviewed journals like the American Journal of Physiology, Circulation, and the American Journal of Hematology. He's held key positions at major agencies like Ogilvy Common Health, including roles such as Chief Creative Officer, Chief Strategic Officer, and Unit President. This is a mind-blowing conversation about the power of AI to make humans better versions of ourselves. John and I explore the idea that generative AI will bring a whole new level to human value and unleash what he calls the cognitive age. We talk about how large language models like ChatGPT will transform our capacity to know, think, and understand, and may even expand our sense of who we are as humans. And we talk about why the best response to the AI revolution is to embrace our humanity. Let's dive in and get ready for the future. John, your work and thought leadership are at the convergence of technology and humanity. Yeah, and that and that's a huge part of what this podcast is about: sort of shedding light on how technology impacts humans, and how as we move forward into the future, humans and technology can combine for the better.、Mm-hmm. So I'm so thrilled to have you here to share some of the things that you learned in your incredible cutting edge work. But before we Get into all of that. How did you become John Noster? Like this John Noster? It's interesting.、Um, it's it's been a journey. I think it's fair to say that it's been an earn a, a journey of unexpected twists and turns. My background originally is in cardiovascular pathophysiology. So、um, I studied science. I studied really weird esoteric things like cell volume regulation and preservation of ischemic myocardium, whatever that means. And and the track was to be in medical school in an MD PhD program, and and、um, I was very lucky that when I was eighteen I published my first paper, and and got a little bit of notoriety as as a good thinker,、um, but it was boring. It just wasn't right for me. I, I like creative thought, eclectic thought, and ended up leaving that that world of of medicine, and that was at Harvard Medical School, by the way.、Um, And wandering the earth a little bit, and I found my way into healthcare advertising and marketing of all places. And for about twenty years, twenty-five、uh, years,、um, I worked for、uh, that industry as the chief creative officer, the chief strategic officer, as well as the unit president、uh, for a company、mm-hmm. called Ogilvy that some of your listeners might know, the biggest、yeah. healthcare communications company in the world. So I jokingly、yeah. tell people today that I'm bilingual. Uh, that I speak medicine and marketing, and it's a really interesting combination. But that's、mm. that's the first half of my career.、Um, the second half of my career, when I left、uh, the constraints and the rigidity of advertising and marketing,、um, mm. I wanted to begin to explore the impact of technology, particularly in medicine, and that's where Nostalab was born out of. And it's evolved to become less about the. Convergence of technology and medicine, and more about the convergence of technology and humanity. 
because the implications yeah. of technology are are much less granular, a smarter uh, piece of technology, a faster chip or a better x-ray machine. These things, these things are important, of course, but I found that the implications are so profound, so vast, that that's where it pushed me into the application of technology in the context of humanity. And then, then of course, percolating through this was the aspect of artificial intelligence. And about a year or two ago, this crazy thing called LLMs and GPT um, burst on the scene. And I believe mm. it was the proverbial asteroid, um, yeah. like the ones that killed the dinosaurs and changed the world. Um, mm. I think that large language models, for a variety of reasons, are the proverbial asteroid that is really putting humanity um, on a significant pivot and really launching uh, something that we'll talk about later that, I, that I've coined mm -hmm. and is some, some traction now about okay. this notion of the cognitive age, because it. it's all about thinking. It's the cognitive construct generated, owned, and sort of the, the domain of humanity that's now being impinged upon and augmented by technology. By these large language models. Yes. Interesting. Okay. So what's, what's the day in the life of of this kind of person, this kind of thinker, like what? How do what do you get up to in the day? A day in the life of John Nasta. Yes. Okay. This is interesting because um, I've structured my life um, around certain goals, so it's not it's not arbitrary. So my I get up in the morning and I make a pot of coffee. So I have my my coffee because I think that that for me caffeination mm. is part of the process. I, I think that there is a a caffeine mediated. Um, intensity that brings me, <laughs> right? It brings me to my computer screen. Now, my cognitive capacity is augmented by caffeine. Now, that's a well-established <laughs> phenomenon. We know caffeine is added to medicines to make pain medicines work better. So, you know, it's that coffee cup. However, there is another level of caffeination to my morning that has emerged that is just important. So, so I pour myself a good big cup of coffee. And I learned something on GPT. So that's, that's I, get hilarious. To, I get to speak with the smartest people in the world. I can learn about um, coding. I can learn about philosophy. I can ask about Aristotle's perspective on morning beverages like tea or coffee. Or I can mm. learn things that, that are more sophisticated. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be um, frivolous. It could be, you know, real interesting stuff. So for me, my morning is is about thinking. And I think that really mm. is ultimately what defines us. So um, I, I provide the template for my cognitive advancement, which is both caffeination and large language models. And then, and then do two things, I think and I write. And, and those two are intertwined dynamics, you know, and, and it, it allows me to kind of sort of carve out this sort of reality for the day. Um, mm. The interesting thing about, about many writers, and I'm sure... Amisha, that you've experienced this is that writers have a bit of an internal monologue, right? We have a we have a voice in our head, and it's really a matter of learning, developing our knowledge base, that corpus of information, and then empowering the voice in our head. That voice in our head can be translated to speech, or it can be translated to the written word. So that inner monologue is fundamental and critical. Nurturing it and fostering it is is at the heart of, of my day, you know, it's how can I, mm. how can I keep the thought engines going? But here's the, here's the twist to that. Mm. Large language models, GPT-4, you know, those things, ChatGPT have introduced a fundamentally transformative new, and new concept into this. It's the inner dialogue. It's my ability to interact with large language models to have an engaging conversation. Here's the interesting thing. It's no longer a search query in the old days of Google, right? It is an iterative dialogue. So my iterative dialogue that I have with my friend, LLM, in the morning with my coffee conjures and fosters this new type of not inner dialogue, uh, inner monologue, but inner dialogue. Mm -hmm. I think that's fundamentally transformative. You can look at that in the context of, of a dress rehearsal for life. 
something as mundane mm-hmm. as that. You could you can look at it as in the context of just sort of organizing your thoughts, or you could even look at this iterative process in a deep introspective and contemplative perspective. So mm-hmm. I think it's we haven't even got out of my first cup of coffee yet, but these are the yeah. things that are kind of going around in my head. So to yeah. me, that's really interesting. And that's one of the, the fundamental aspects about the large language model systems is that it engages you in a way that is as modern as hell, but as old as life itself. And, and the, the analogy I'm drawing here is that engagement, that back and forth iteration that I find so mm-hmm. powerful is a Socratic mm-hmm. engagement, yeah. Socratic dialogue, yeah. right? Yeah, it is. It is, and that's what we're getting now. So our ability yeah. to to create that dynamic. So, so that's my day. Sometimes um, I consult with companies, um, mm-hmm. and, and they want to know what I'm thinking about, right? So, so my engagement with them is a very cognitive engagement. I'm using the word cognition here very, very yeah. specifically. The nature yeah. of engagement is not task oriented; it's cognitively oriented. Sometimes. Uh, I'll give a speech. So I do a lot of speaking around the world. And again, the mm-hmm. nature of that engagement is not, in a simple of, of terms, an oral engagement. It's a cognitive engagement. You know, when you think about um, the Upanishads, the ancient mm-hmm. Hindu scriptures, they, they're, the Upanishad roughly translates, means to sit up close. Very much like the Socratic dialogue. It's the oral tradition, mm. student <clears throat> and master. So... Mm. Sitting up close does allow an oral tradition, but it manifests principally as a cognitive construct. So whether I'm at my computer drinking my cup of coffee, having an engaged dialogue with, um, with a large language model, or I'm speaking with a client, or I'm giving a speech, ultimately for me, it's that level of cognitive engagement. And, and just mm. to put a period at the end of this thing, and I know I'm talking too much already, Misha. Uh, well, the... The idea here is that the ultimate engagement, hmm. ultimate human engagement is cognitive. It's Maslow. We're moving beyond just do I feel happy. Happy is an overrated articulation of human engagement. I think, yes, I can be happy, but am I engaged? And, and we look at, at, at Abe Maslow's hierarchy of the self. Mm-hmm. That's where mm-hmm. we're going. That's where we're going. It's technology is pushing us not into a functional perspective, but into a, a self-realized perspective. And and that the but data is even there. And and you're saying that that self-realization is mm-hmm. coming via deeper cognitive understanding, awareness, interaction, engagement. Yeah. So it's it's a cognitive process. Rather it's, than an emotional one, rather than a, a spiritual one. I mean, how well, are you? Yeah, I think you can push this? in that direction. I think you could argue that many people who have deep intellectual engagements find an aspect of spirituality intrinsic to that. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, th- I think that's absolutely the case. But mm. I do believe, and here's, and I, I call it, I call it the productivity triad. There's actually data on this. And mm-hmm. when we look at the use of large language models in the context of, let's say, working, the workforce, mm-hmm. right? We see two things that emerge, and that's all that anyone talks about. Number one is speed. I can get it done faster, okay? Yeah. Right? And then number two is they can get it done better. So in other words, I have mm-hmm. the speed to, let's say, to write 500 words. And because I'm using this profound corpus of information that transcends mm-hmm. my individual knowledge base My range. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and I connect through it through this neural web that finds mm-hmm. things that not only do I not know that I would not even have thought about, but there's mm-hmm. an element here and I'm sitting down. Let's go back to the cup of coffee. What do I talk about? I'm having coffee with Socrates, right? I am mm. actually having this iterative dialogue that is stimulating, that is provoking, that is enlightening my cognitive capacity such that I'm having a really good time. And that's the third part of the productivity triad. It's not just speed. It's not just the quality. It's not just productivity in a sense. It's that I, as an engaged participant in this process, whether it be functional like work or academic or even me just sitting at my desk, gives me a sense of engagement, creative engagement that I feel empowered, 
and and I feel in a way actualized in the context of Maslow's hierarchy. So, I mean, there's so many things going on here that it, you know, it kind of blows my mind. I, I have to say, John, this is the best take I've had, I've heard uh, about use of LLMs and their value. This mm. is by far this Thanks. sort of... Uh, Moving it into I just made realm. it up. I mean, it's like, I, I'm just kidding. I'm reading the LLM script on the side here that's telling me what to say. The, it's, it's, you've, you've taken it out of the realm of just like functionality and mm-hmm. productivity and doing stuff and doing stuff faster and put into the realm of human, human, yeah. human uh, it's, uh, it's potential and human yeah. accomplishment, human fulfillment. And that yeah. is actually interesting because the rest of the stuff is just like you know everybody's on the same hamster wheel doing things faster and quicker who cares but when you get into when you bring it to the point of wait a minute here this is going to give individuals a whole other level of fulfillment of value for their humanity now you're getting that sexy that's important that is the point that is useful that is an addition to the world everything else is just more of the more of like insanity but this is valuable very exciting so how do you see this then changing the way everyday humans function because we hear a lot about Mm -hmm. the perils of introducing this kind of technology into the wild right we, we, we and we see it and, and there's some there's some truth to all of that and there's some validity to all of it and right. there's some issues with the models and, and the, right all, of the, all of that right there. none Stop. of that's none of that's none of that's not true but this is much more relevant and much more true so how do you see this playing out in, this, in adding this, value to people's lives day to day because that's so exciting a, ai is our oxygen mm-hmm. AI is a companion that allows us to pierce the veil of mythology, of, of the myth I, in which we live. Of so, what? Well, I'm mm. going to tell you. Okay, let's yeah, go for it. I like it. This is really important. Um, we yeah. live. We we live in illusion. In an illusion. One hundred percent. Right, mm-hmm. and and you can you let's let you want to be a physicist, and we talk about. Um, the electromagnetic spectrum. Do you want? Do you want to be a? You know, you can you can approach this so many different ways. But our sensory mm-hmm. reality is only a small part of the broader human reality in which we live. Right? 100%. My dog Ollie can smell forty times greater than I can. A, a bear in the woods can smell three thousand times greater than I can. So their sensory reality, just from that meager perspective, is 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 you know is quite different. Let's just use the word different for now. Yeah. Um, and what I, what I believe is that mm-hmm. AI will create a and, and I'm very I'm, I'm very concerned about the use of these words. I want to go back mm-hmm. and talk about this notion of the hyper reality the, and, and the hyper reality is a, a fascinating book um, that, that talked is based the book is based on the movie um, The Matrix was based on this book Simulcra and simulation mm-hmm. and the book talked about realities or copies where there's a copy but no original. In other words, it's the contrived construct. It's almost like these digital selfies. Okay, I know this is getting a little esoteric, but when no, did you, ever see, did you ever see the selfie that that makes an image of you based upon an existing photograph? It builds this image, and in this image, you're sexier. Your teeth are whiter, you're you're skinnier or buff, whatever it is. It's an artificial um, reality. And those are called, that's called a um, a hyper reality, right? Hyper real. Mm. And that's been the dilemma of a lot of the emergence of of things like um, um, images, um, things like um, um, artwork, uh, the whole, the whole uh, Gen AI movement, right? Everything yeah. feels a little weird. Yeah, right. It's 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 kind of an interesting picture. Wow, it's even a better picture of me than I've no, I've I've even noticed. But but something's not quite right. So that's the hyper reality. That's something that we are in the throes in. I believe that there's an alternate to that that is emerging now that is a function of the AI LLM dynamic, and that is the super reality. 
The super reality is the is the ability to see something that is conjured by AI that actually builds and conjures the reality that we can't interpret. So a super reality through AI can see, can analyze, can calculate in many dimensions, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's like a hypercube, if you will. And I think that's going to be a very, very interesting uh, manifestation of AI. It's going to do, let... Do you think that hmm? using the current models allow mm-hmm. this? No, no, not at all. No, so, no. So you're, you're saying this is down the road? Yeah, well, I think that... GPT-5, gonna... GPT-5, GPT-6, I mean, what are we looking at? Well, look, I mean, think about the path and the timeline. It's been, it's been extraordinarily fast. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stop and go to a new topic, but let's come back to this, okay? Because people often talk about our, the nature of change as exponential. We are living in an exponential world, right? Where things mm-hmm. happen not on a linear basis. We all love linear, right? That's how we live. Our interest rate, think. our our IRA, yeah. the money we invest, blah, blah, blah. That's linear. Linear mm-hmm. feels good. Mm-hmm. Exponential is kind of where people like Peter Diamandis and Ray Kurzweil and those guys talk about. That's yeah. a curve, right? That's a shift. We are now moving even beyond that into the context of stacked innovation. It's innovation driving innovation itself. If you remember the chart that came out that showed the acceptance of GPT, it wasn't mm-hmm. a curve. It went straight up. And that, you that mean the, the adoption of the GPT. adoption yeah, of GPT. Yeah. Now those charts yeah. were, you know, a lot of mumbo jumbo around them, but let's just take them as fact for now. That mm. does something very interesting from a mathematical perspective. Vertical acceleration straight up. It's actually innovation that is yeah. driving. It's innovation to the power of innovation or AI to the power of AI. And that's called stacked okay. innovation. And we saw mm-hmm. multimodal kind of pop out of nowhere, right? I can put a picture of pasta into an LLM and it'll give me the recipe. Or I can put in an electrocardiogram of a lethal arrhythmia and the LLM will tell me what that arrhythmia is. It's, it's multimodal. So it's interpreting reality in a way that we do. Now, that's, that's the premise to this idea of not hyper-reality, but super-reality, because LLMs will now interpret reality from a contextual process that transcends human sensory analytics. I see how you're thinking about this. I love how mm-hmm. you're thinking about it. If this were actually going to play out, I think mm-hmm. this would be incredible. What is, from a factual point of view, what is the evidence that you're basing your sort of thinking process on. So I'm not disputing it. I'm just saying, okay, okay good. Sure, now, sure. how do we, how are you, how are you backing this up with facts? Uh, well, I'm, I'm just- why, I'm, you, why are you so sure this is happening? I'm I mean, putting the yes, pieces those, together, okay? Right, so these individual things are happening. It's just a matter of putting these pieces together and establishing a reality that we know is there. It, 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 you know, we live in something called Flatland now. Um, Flatland, um, was a, a fascinating story. It was actually a romance story about people who live on a two-dimensional, let's say, tabletop. And, and one day, these people who only have two dimensions saw a little dot. And then the mm-hmm. dot became a circle. The circle became bigger. The mm-hmm. circle went away. And then they said, wow, it was a circle. And what they saw was a sphere. But no one could understand the sphere because they live in flatland. We live in flatland today and AI is letting us understand what the sphere is. What are the things that we're seeing or not quite seeing that, that you've seen that, that lead you to think that, okay, this is, this is how you're putting it all together. Like we're in this two dimensional world and there are mm-hmm. bits and pieces that we can see with our our senses. And now AI is going to let us see all, all this other stuff. But how are you getting to that conclusion? I'm not disputing. I'm, I, uh-huh. I love it. I just want the audience to understand how I'm, your thinking sure. process, because, because you pull this all together, because I think it's beautiful and delicious. Well, you know, look, it's, it's, it's the path, right? I'm speaking of a trajectory, not a okay. reality. So what I'm doing is I'm sort of, putting the pieces together to say that what I believe is that the AI conjured reality will give us a new reality that is beyond our sensory perception. And I call that a super reality. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. How does this change the world for a regular, so regular bloke? 
girl, whomever, right? How does this change the world for them now that they have access to all of this? How does it change the world for the, the normal? Well, you know, it, 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 there's functional changes in terms of their ability mm-hmm. maybe to, to look at a, a broader reality in the context of art. Maybe it even has an emotional context in, in, in aspects of love. But I think what it is, it is give, brings us closer to the reality and the reality of what we are. So you're saying up until now, humans have been limited by their senses and limited by the physical world, what they can see, what they can understand, and also the kinds of thinking that we have around the, the stories that we built around yeah, what exists. Yeah, it's and, not- and, and, so, and, now, and now AI, you're saying AI, can yeah. pierce that and help us actually yeah. see the truth look, of what exists. It, the simplest of terms, AI is the third window into humanity. Let's look at it this way, okay? Mm. The first window was the telescope. The microscope yeah. was the second window into reality. Right. I believe that mm. AI, in the same way as we've been talking about for the past 15 minutes, is the third window into humanity. And, and I, that's probably the simplest like way it. of thinking about it. I love it. I love it. Okay. Very beautiful. So as we head into this future where AI allows us this window, this portal, this huge opening to see what really exists, what excites you about that? Of of course, seeing what really exists is powerful and world-changing and incredible. But why is that exciting for you, John Nosta? Why do you care about that? Because you could care about a lot of other things. Why does this matter to you? Right. I think that that ultimately I care about it because it is it is such a profound frontier of reality. That that, that is, um, you know, and I talked about this a little earlier. Earlier, I touched on. I shouldn't have used this word. I should have saved it for later because it's a good word. Good word. It's a search for truth, and truth has been the goal of almost any discipline, the philosopher's search for truth, the clinician's search for truth, the scientist's search for truth. What is humanity's search for truth? And I think never before have we been enabled to go on that journey and to discover something that allows us to see and hear and taste the truth in a very personal way that is profoundly transformative. So that's, it it can't but excite me there is no other path. There is no other reality for me. So um, it's, it's, it's quite extraordinary. Now, here's the other thing. With Gutenberg and, and the printing press, mm-hmm. that was a wonderful, um, a wonderful opportunity to democratize information because now we, yeah. can, we can print and we can have people look and read and learn. And, and yeah. similarly with Google that we had – um, this opportunity to have access to information. But the access to information was very sort of one-dimensional, if you will. It's like, here is the information. But with large language models, we're not just accessing the information. We're accessing the cognitive dynamic that aligns with human thinking to activate our own thought. So that's that third step. It's not just handing us information. It's working with us in a cognitive capacity to help us think. And there's nothing more magical than that. So why I'm excited is because I can conjure my reality and I can explore it in ways that are that are profound and transcendent and ultimately lead to a path of spirituality. I'm not sure what the word is. Um, Mm -hmm. A path of knowing, a path of empowerment. Our brains are fundamentally wired for a transcendent reality. I've always said that that genius is our birthright and mediocrity is self-imposed. Our brains are optimized for heightened function. I believe our brain has almost an infinite capacity for cognitive function. And that aligns very magically with LLMs. It's a marriage of two cognitive domains that have been waiting for each other for thousands of years. That is so cool. I love it. Okay, John, <laughs> so good. But what uh, what's the counterpoint to all of this? So this mm-hmm. this is one this is one way forward, mm-hmm. and it's a way you say it. It's so cool. What what would be the counterpoint to this? Because we do exist in a world of 
duality. So we are now at the pinnacle of technology. AI is a very, very extraordinary point in, in human development and technological development. But let's go back to our first technology. Now, I get an argument about this, but I'm, let's just for the sake of argument agree. It's fire. Okay. Fire was our mm-hmm. first technology. It allowed us to do very, very interesting things. It allowed us right. to travel, migrate, heat a house. It allowed us to cook food and, and to eat protein that grew our brains. So fire was an amazing sense of wonder, mm-hmm. right? It was also an amazing sense of fear. It had a duality of wonder and fear because not only could I heat my house, I could burn your house down. I could use fire as a weapon, mm-hmm. right? So, so now we move thousands of years forward into human history where we've fully mitigated this construct of fire, right? No, absolutely not. The sense of wonder and fear still exists for fire. In fact, fire is still the single legal, the single largest cause of property damage in the world today. So have we yeah. controlled the wonder of fire? No, no, we haven't. The bigger the wonder the bigger the fear. And we see it in 1917 with the airplane. Airplane lands in your yard and some guy jumps out and takes his goggles off, you know, and says, hey, Misha, come on, let's go for a ride. Bring the kids, bring your family. You're like, no, thanks. That's the coolest thing I ever saw. But not, I'm I'm not going in there. Driverless car, same thing. I'm not going to go drive on the highway without a driver. And we are at that same point in human history. We are at the point where AI being arguably the, the greatest innovation carries with it the most profound aspect of both wonder and fear. So so I I don't I don't worry as much as a lot of people. Most people get their information about the dystopian reality of AI from Hollywood. Oh from sci-fi, yeah. They cite it, they cite yeah. sci-fi, maybe Isaac Asimov yeah. if they're a little sophisticated, but perhaps yeah, yeah. they it's the Terminator. That is yeah. the worldview. So I think that's completely inappropriate, ill-founded, and rather stupid. Like, I'd be lost without my glasses. The only way I can see the truth is to put my glasses on. And the only way for me to yeah. see that transcendent human truth may be through a functional integration with technology and AI. I love your perspective. I think it's the best I've heard, unquestionably, um, as we sort of bump up against large language models and, and this whole new thing that's unfurling. Okay. Okay. What are the necessary components? What needs to happen for this to be the what actually unfolds? Because this is good. I like that trajectory that you've mm-hmm. laid out. Yes, bring it mm-hmm. on. This is mm-hmm. sexy and cool and awesome and what every human would want. I can't see anybody not wanting what you've talked about. Well, what, what, what are the factors? What yeah. needs to happen for that to be what actually plays out in real life? In- interestingly, um, you know, this is a complex, this is basically around the theory of the diffusion of innovation. And the diffusion of innovation is, is, is both sort of a, a scientific diffusion, if you will, but it's also human nature. I think that we're going to see fear that is part, partly mediated by the dynamic of, of wonder and fear. Um, I think that we're going to see people who have a certain sort of human inertia and technological inertia. But, you know, some people will not get a new phone um, because that's just the way it is, right? I'm using a dial phone and the only way I get a new phone is if they make those things literally unavailable. Um, th- then there's this other axis, which which is the technological axis, which is driving the change, right? What are, what are the technologies that are available? And, and we haven't even talked about the, the speed of that change because mm. we as humans cannot understand, interpret, and assimilate those changes because they're happening so quickly. You know, um, and then the other one is this whole is, is, is functional. And I usually say it's either functional or financial, because sometimes people just don't have access to some of this technology. Um, so it's really a multi-dimensional um, thing. And, and the interesting thing to me is that that the solutions will come from technology itself. That I think that technology will solve these problems in a sort of transcendent kind of way. That that costs will be mediated by 
the understandings of a large language model. I'll give you a crazy example. Um, take a large language model base and then put into that into that corpus the U.S. patent records from the patent office. Mm. Yeah. Put them in, and then interrogate that model and say, find me new ways to filter water that is inexpensive. So mm. the problem, societal problems are coming out of this technological construct. And I, I just want to touch on one other thing, which is a really, really big problem. When I make something better, oftentimes the counterpart to that is obsolete. It's no longer used. So now I have a car that goes faster. Okay. So my old car is no longer useful. I get a new car. I win as a human. For the first mm. time in human history, human cognition itself is the point of obsolescence. So and what do you have to say about that? Is well, that is, here's the how, do you, how do you feel about that? Is that a good thing? Is this just inevitable? Well, I think that there's a sense of inevitability to it, but I think that we have to create AIs in the models of humans. You know, when my children grew up, they, they, would, they would struggle with the idea of chopping a tree down. It was antithetical to them because they've grown up green, right? They've grown up in a earth-centric perspective, right? That's the way their mind works. Yeah. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. I think that AI, in some capacity, has to be human-centric AI. And I've talked about this. I said it's not AI. It's human intelligence. It's HI. And I find it quite interesting that HI is high. HI is in of itself the word hello. So, you know, and even Elon so talk, talk, about so, this. Yeah. John, talk mm-hmm. about human-centric intelligence, human-centric mm-hmm. machine intelligence, right? And because yeah. the artificial intelligence, such a, it, the, the name itself well, is ridiculous. Yeah. It's machine intelligence, but let's talk about models built around. Yeah. They are. I mean, they're not built. Way. They're, it's not, they're not built that way. They are that way because we create large language models on the basis of human information. It's built on the human corpus of information. Now, interestingly, this dystopian reality that we often talk about, you know, mm. the evil overlords will kill us, that makes its way into the public stream of consciousness, right? Yeah. It becomes part of the public stream of consciousness and may have in a very, very strange way a self-fulfilling reality because LLMs are trained on that very data. So LLMs will learn that they are evil and they will destroy humanity. So I think that we have to be aware that we have to build it in this human-centric dynamic. So it's kind of funny. But 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 also, but but, but, but true and and brilliantly said, but Mm -hmm. also... Um, LLMs are based on on the corpus of all of you know, human information and human, human history knowledge. and human human knowledge. Is, yes, we have there's good and there's bad. So there's, there's all of humanity. There's evil and then there's good. Well, there's genius and then there's no no there's it's all, all good. It. No no no, Misha, it's all good. Could you imagine a child? No, wait 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 wait. Hang on. Yeah, I'm not saying. I am saying that throughout human history, if yes, we, if we if we fed between the LLM on all of the information all the acts of human beings Mm -hmm. throughout history. Mm -hmm. Um, There are acts and behaviors and uh, things that were evil. And then there's, there are things that were good. So there's Nazism and then there's like great humanitarian activity. But but they Um, are. So you're training the. No, you can't. So let's take Nazism out of the LLM, right? Okay. In other words, let's raise a child built on pure joy and happiness. That child will be as functional as anyone. Hey, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm not saying that we shouldn't train them on all of this information, mm-hmm. but based on what you were saying, saying okay, so uh, somebody says the evil AI overlords are going to do this to us, and then mm-hmm. that pervades the public sphere, and then yeah. that goes back into the model, yeah. and then now the model becomes it becomes a self fulfilling yes, prophecy, exactly, perpetuates. Exactly. Okay, so I'm saying, by extension. The basic information that's going into the model is already based on all of the things that exist in humanity. If everything is good, if all information is useful for the model, then all information is useful for the model. Maybe the model should know yes. that there could be evil AI overlords you, that could be using it for, for if malintent. You, yeah. If you, if you push me, if you push me to an answer, I'd say yes. I agree 100%. But you know, also, you know, human achievement is defined by failure. 
I, I mean, let me try to make my point here. Fail, 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 and then you get to the mountaintop. And then you are acclaimed as a great hero. Technological achievement is not defined by that. It's defined by the single failure. Once technolo- technology can achieve, 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 and then fail, the news is failure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Humans yeah. fail, 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 achieve, and the news is the achievement. And that's, I think, that that for me, the trajectory of large language models and AI and, and this technology is extraordinary. To look at it where it is today is is just a very meager perspective. So I think it's very easy to look at intrinsic bias. It's easy to look at confabulation or hallucination, which is kind of the word of the day. But I would like also to look at the frailty of humanity. Look at the frailty of of a worker on an assembly line or or a pilot or someone driving a car. Remember, 36,000 people die every year in America because of driving accidents. Yet when Tesla has one accident, that's the news. So I think that we can't compare technology to perfection. We have to compare technology to the human standard. And then we begin to see how powerful it is. I completely, I think that's absolutely fair and makes complete sense. And we, we over dramatize every, all the tiny flaws and try to point fingers and say, oh, that's problematic when really it's not. So totally fair. Um, Okay. Let's put that aside and move on to where, so a lot of exciting things are happening with these advancements. What, what, in, from your perspective, should people be preparing for or thinking about? So somebody has their, you know, they went to university and they did really well and they have a career and now they're professional and they're doing this. And along comes this transformative technology yeah. that really throws everything up in the air um, and many other things that are happening all at the mm-hmm. same time. These powerful things are converging. What do you, from your perspective, what should people be thinking about? Like, and how should they be adapting, adjusting, preparing for this very different future? My, my daughters are 15. I have twin, twin girls who are 15. Five years ago, I would have told them that they should learn code, right? No, Five years ago, okay. maybe three years ago. Now I'm like, why would you bother coding? It's, it's silly, right? Now yeah. I think what, what, the, what the, the, the fundamental and, and, and fascinating insight that I would tell people is embrace your humanity that as the stark counterpoint to the technological revolution is, is humanity. And, and it's the ability to articulate philosophy and passion and love that is empowered through LLMs that will take us to a new level. So I don't think you can fight. You're never going to learn the articulation of pi 3.14159 better than an llm it will always win never yeah but but maybe there's an element of love that becomes the transcendent reality there's a short story by kurt vonnegut called epicac and i would challenge everyone to go and read i think it's 7 or 5 pages long it's about a computer that falls in love and it was, I think, written like 1960 or so, but it is so relevant today because it, it teaches us that there is a human component. So go and read Shakespeare and throw away these books on coding and embrace our humanity because that's the path forward that will be augmented and, and, and reimagined through technology. Beautiful. I love it. Okay. What... So everyone's journey gives them unique insights and understandings of the world, like secrets that they've garnered along the way. What do you know, John, that maybe the rest of us don't? I I said it earlier, and I'll recant. I'm not going to recant it. I'm going to say it again. Genius is our birthright, and mediocrity is self-imposed. We stand. What do you mean by that? We we have an innate cognitive ability. Our brains are optimized. And sometimes we we experience that optimization like Einstein, like Kepler, like Newton, in these brief transient moments of illumination. We we know them, we've all had them. We we call them the aha moments. 
And those aha moments are not just transient feelings of sort of connectedness. They are, they are our genius moments. And I believe that our humanity has that built into us, that, that, that timeless magical moment mediated by cognition is here today. So it, it's important to recognize that genius is not a fixed reality. We think of genius as Albert Einstein in his office getting the right questions correct all the time, right? A continuous period of sort of functional illumination. That's quite wrong. I mean, when we think about Einstein, he had one good year, right? He had a couple good theories. And then the rest of his life, he languished looking, at, at looking for, for a unified field theory. So again, he had these moments. Everyone has these moments. Michael Jordan on the basketball court has that moment of heightened experience, of heightened engagement. It's not called the aha moment for him. It's called being in the zone. So we have that as humans, the ability to access that zone. And that zone will be mediated. Our guide to that zone is large language models. Um. You're such a fascinating thinker. I know that I probably should have asked you this earlier on, but it's really only just popping up for me now. Who, who was the greatest influence? Which thinker, philosopher, scientist, ideator was the, probably influenced you the most? Like, who do you look to? Influenced me the most? Yeah. Yeah. Who do you think? Or maybe none, or maybe none at all. I, I, you know, I mean, it, it, again, it's, it's, that's, a, that's a very complicated discussion. I mean, if you look at mm. society, you could argue that my father had a tremendous influence on me. The fact that he okay. died when I was in my early 20s is a, in of itself was, um, was a powerful instrument. instrument. Yeah. But he was an electrical engineer, and um, he had some problems with his heart. And, and because of that, I became very, very interested in understanding the heart. And it was that understanding and that drive for knowledge and wisdom that drove me into that MD PhD program where I published these papers as a young kid. And, and that was the trajectory, um, that, that set me on my path. And I think that for me, it comes down to, um, the idea of taking the shot, um, that, And what I mean by that is when I was a little kid playing basketball, I was a good team player, but I often subordinated my role and passed it off to this other kid named Kevin, and I didn't take the shot. And and to me, I think that that's what we have to do. We have to take take the shot. And and that's, you know, so so inspired by my father, um, and I'm inspired, you know, sometimes it's 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 somebody like Newton, you know, somebody yeah. um um I mean, there are just so many interesting thinkers, mathematicians, clinicians that that inspire me. And what inspires me is not necessarily their observation, but their path, their torment. Um, I'll give you an example of a, a physician who said that we should wash our hands before we do an operation. It took him 60 years for this idea to catch on, to decrease um, the mortality of moms in childbirth by 30%, 40%. He died in an yeah. insane asylum, never seeing his thoughts actualized. And th- those are very interesting to me. I, I, I'm inspired by inspiration. I'm inspired by the things I see and the things I feel. I'm asking all of my guests to give our art listeners one thing to do when they get off. Because listen, people listen to all these podcasts, they get all this information. It's very cool, but there's... Not, I want people to sort of maybe recognize really thinking. recognize recognize the extraordinary cognitive capacity that they have recognize that genius is your birthright within them yes recognize that and the and 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 also recognize that the genius experience is not a fixed reality it's a punctuated experience einstein had a couple good ideas that was it yeah. We all have these punctuated experiences. We, we experience the zone. We experience the aha moment. We experience things like timelessness, where we're on the phone with someone for three yeah. or four hours, and it's the greatest conversation yeah. we ever had, and there was zero fatigue, zero yeah. fatigue, very much unlike the muscle fatigue of doing that sprint. And that, that, yeah. 
infinite cognitive capacity, if I dare use that word, is something that we have to embrace and recognize that that is our birthright. I love it, love it, love it, love it. Okay, what's 2024 going to be like for you? It's going to be a lot of thinking. It's going to be a lot of stepping over the boundaries of the borders. Um, Because I think that we are moving into this new domain, this cognitive era. And I think we have to begin to think about the what ifs. It's my job to get ahead of the curve. And, and when you try to jump ahead of the curve, you're often wrong, if not always wrong. But if you're lucky enough to be right, you can help transform society in that context. So for me, it's thinking. It literally is that, that good cup of coffee in the morning and working with my partner. It's not me, right? It's my inner dialogue, that inner dialogue mediated by technology. That, that's, that's number one. Number two, it's speaking with people. It's it's. I do a lot of speaking around the world and I find it really fascinating to kind of dig in and have these conversations with people. And we all have, we all have our mini aha moments and, and together our two heads come together synaptically. We are, they are like two synapses coming together and create the magic. And that's what I hope to happen this year. Yeah, that's, that is, I was thinking about that before the conversation today. I was like, What's what? Is, why do I do this? Because when two people come together, come together, yeah. and they're having a conversation, and you leave space for new things to sort of unfold, it's incredibly like the most beautiful thing ever. Because like boom, something else happens. Something yeah. else is thought or said that was never done before, or at least in one's own consciousness, never never occurred before. So it's there's a, so powerful. There's a physics principle called super radiance. When, when two particles are aligned, the force is the force that is emitted, the energy that is emitted goes by the number squared. So when mm. three particles are aligned, the force is not one plus one plus one equals three. It's three squared or nine. When five particles are aligned, it's five squared or 25. When 100 mm. particles are aligned, it is mm. 10,000. So mm. I think that sometimes um, when we have coherent thought, when, when people come together and think in, interestingly, in interesting ways, um, yeah. there is a certain super radiance that comes out of that. Yeah. Um, okay, so this has been incredible. I mean, I love it. Uh, anything else you wanted to say or you would say to our audience as you as we close out today? Go on Twitter. Go on X and join the conversation. There we live in the context of the idea. If I type in 140 words or 280 or now as much as you want, it's the power of the idea, not the power of the individual. So, so that would be my challenge to people is to share their thinking and, and ideas from – thought leaders and ideas from students or people who've only had one idea in their life uh, come to life there. So I've always found it very, very, um, very, very exciting to kind of interact with people. And it's my, it's my promise to the people that are listening is I'll follow you. I'll speak with you. I want to be engaged because I don't know where the idea comes from. I will make sure to put your links in the, sure. in the description so people can follow you and, and, and talk with you and, and learn and share. Make sure to listen, follow, and subscribe for new episodes wherever you get your podcasts and on our YouTube channel.